My name is Anthony Posada. I'm a supervising attorney in the Community Justice Unit of the Legal Aid Society. The Legal Aid Society is the nation's largest and oldest not-for-profit legal services provider. In just last year alone, we represented over 230,000 indigent New Yorkers who were accused of a crime, committing a crimes or of unlawful conduct throughout trial, appeal, and post-conviction matters. As a supervising attorney of the Community Justice Unit, we provide legal services and advice in specific catchment areas throughout the five boroughs to organizations who are de dedicated and focused on anti-violence services through the city council funded cure violence model. The public health model which originated as ceasefire in Chicago responds to gun violence services in the community with wraparound services that include mediation, social services, violence interrupters, education, and legal support. The model works on the theory that conflicts addressed by credible messengers from the community prevent further violence. First, I want to talk about some of the racial disparities that we have noticed from the Legal Aid Society representations. Uh, the Legal Aid Society represents thousands of New Yorkers each year in criminal and Supreme Courts who are facing marijuana possession charges. Each one of those arrests, as pointed out by my colleague, has far-reaching deep consequences, which include deportation, eviction, monetary fines and surcharges, negative impact on financial aid, license suspension, and work opportunities, and as was pointed out earlier, with a much urgency, the removal of your, having your child taken away from your own home. Uh, marijuana prohibition is a tool of hyper-criminalization. In 2016, the Legal Aid Society represented approximately 10,000 New Yorkers who were charged with marijuana possession charges. The city breakdown of those arrests was as follows. In the Bronx, we represented 1,991 people. In Brooklyn, we represented 2,830 people. In New York County, we represented 2,970 people. In Queens, we represented 1,728 people, and in Richmond County, we represented 369 people. The majority of the people arrested in those neighborhoods were between the ages of 16 and 25 years old. That same year, the NYPD, this is a number that we've talked about already a lot today, arrested a total of close to 18,200 New Yorkers for the lowest level marijuana possession charge. Of New York City's 76 neighborhood police precincts, 37 neighborhoods have a majority of black and Latinx residents, and they have about half of the city's population. Again, of the city's 76 neighborhood police precincts, 37 neighborhoods have a majority of black and Latino residents, and they have about half the city's population. These 37 neighborhoods account for 66% of the marijuana possession arrests and 92% of the people arrested in those neighborhoods were black and Latinx. This Jim Crow policing of marijuana enforcement is reality for black and Latin Latinx New Yorkers everywhere in New York City. For example, in Manhattan, blacks are 13% of the residents, but 45% of the people arrested for marijuana possession. And similarly in Queens, where blacks are 18% of the residents, but 49% of the people arrested for marijuana. Of the 18,200 New Yorkers who were arrested for marijuana possessions by the NYPD, only 14 of them were in the Upper West Side. And that was not by a mistake. It is clear that there are two different systems of marijuana enforcement based on race and ethnicity, which prey on people of color for possessing small amounts of marijuana. The NYPD continues to stop a disproportionate amount of black and brown New Yorkers based on marijuana possession charges. Black and brown youth from underserved communities all throughout New York City are aggressively stopped, frisked, and then questioned by the police because the officers claim to have smelled marijuana or have seen it burning in public. The fact that these stops and frisks encounters are underreported does not mean that they do not systematically occur or that the Floyd litigation actually ended this tactic. On the contrary, youth and community members at large from predominantly minority communities such as East New York, Far Rockaway, Harlem, South Bronx, and Stapleton 
inform us that the NYPD continues to engage in racial profiling. Some of the stories we have heard include police officers throwing black and brown youth against walls and cars, claiming that they saw the young person smoking marijuana and demanding to know where are the guns in the neighborhood. The criminalization of marijuana in New York City remains focused on black and brown youth, giving off officers another pretext to engage in unlawful stops and frisk. As my colleague Scott pointed out, an arrest is a big deal and it is not a small matter. It has severe psychological and traumatic consequences. I can tell you this because I myself have been arrested for this charge. When I was 17 years old, I was walking the streets of Queens in my neighborhood when two plainclothes detectives, not dressed as police officers, nothing about them said NYPD, jumped out of an unmarked car, meaning a car that does not have any NYPD signs on it. They had their guns drawn out. They threw me up against the wall and they demanded to know where the drugs were at. As a 17-year-old youth, I had no idea what my rights were. I had no idea that I could tell this officer that I was not consenting to their search. I had no idea that I could tell them that I could stay silent. Instead, I was paralyzed and completely in fear. I was afraid of the guns in front of me because I didn't want to lose my own life. I wanted to go back home. I'm handcuffed, I'm put in the back of a police van while the officers are joking about the next bus that they're gonna make. I'm taken to the precinct where I'm photographed, fingerprinted, and then the, the same detective who's taking those prints is telling me not to worry because everything is gonna be okay. That same detective didn't tell me that I could make a phone call. That same detective could have initiated questioning without telling me that I could have spoken to an attorney. And this happens every single day. 12 hours later, I'm finally in central booking speaking to somebody who is not a police officer who's asking me what is my address, whether I work, whether I have a phone number. Because these, I am going to find out later, are gonna be used to calculate whether or not I am worthy of being released. It is only hours later that I finally come to speak to somebody who is telling me what happened. I don't understand what's going on and I go in front of the judge. I'm told to say yes, so I nod my head. I run out of the courtroom after hearing the words marijuana ACD. I don't talk to anybody about that experience. I'm ashamed, I'm afraid. I don't know what people are gonna say and how they're gonna look at me after that. But for all I know, that year was the longest year of my life. Couldn't apply for a job. Remember, I'm 17 at the time. I'm a senior in high school about to apply for financial aid in college, but I can't because the door is closed at that time. What happens a year later, as if everything went away, that same officer, those same detectives are still making arrests on the street. Nobody went back to question their behavior because as Scott pointed out, when an ACD is taken, it means that nothing happened, right? No, that's not true. For the person who got arrested, a lot happened. A lot of real things just happened. It wasn't just a docket number. It wasn't just a statistic. It is a life that is connected to a community. When I go back to my community, what I learned from that moment it crystallized police community relations and the huge distrust that exists. The violent, over-aggressive approach of those detectives was unnecessary. And it's the same approach that leads community members to fear the police. Another problem with this marijuana ACD and with the whole notion of an ACD is just the idea that when it is used for somebody who was accused of possessing small amounts of marijuana, again, that police officer's behavior goes unchecked. And when somebody's not held accountable for their own actions, they could always make up their own rules. As our partnerships have unfolded in the Community Justice Unit, last year I was able to be a part of the joint remedial process as a result of the Floyd litigation in which retired Judge Boleyn who was set up as the monitor, was coming out to different communities all across New York City and holding sessions where he would put together 
youth and young adults to talk about what they were seeing with the police playing out on their streets. In every single one of those sessions, every single black and brown New Yorker expressed frustration with the manner in which the police aggressively and violently approached them for matters related to marijuana possession. In each and every one of those sessions, it was clear that stop and frisk had not gone away. And in each and every one of those sessions, the youth were afraid and scared and paralyzed. They could not look at their streets or sidewalks the same way everybody else does. Because to them, they become the corridors of target practice for the NYPD to arrest black and brown New Yorkers on the allegations of possessions of marijuana. If the police are supposed to help us, how is it that they're coming into the community to unlawfully, aggressively, violently over-police and over-criminalize? It doesn't make sense and it is why marijuana prohibition for too long has been a failed policy, has been disastrous to communities of colors and has wrecked havoc that we're only going to now begin to realize how far deep it goes because again, I want to impress upon you all that as an arrest is not just a simple arrest. It has traumatic and psychological consequences that can lead to other problems. And the field of science is just discovering the huge effects that trauma plays in the life of people. I want to touch briefly on how marijuana enforcement prohibition has fueled the mass incarceration in 2016, marijuana arrests outnumbered all arrests for crimes that the FBI classifies as violent. This means that within the last two minutes of this testimony, an average of two Americans were arrested for marijuana possession. It means that in New York State, marijuana possession accounts for 60 people who are being arrested every day for it. Over 30 years of discriminatory marijuana prohibition in New York, have given us a situation where thousands of New Yorkers are walking around with criminal records as a result of those arrests. Those criminal records are fair game for prosecutors to use when they are requesting bail from judges. Those contacts with the system that resulted in criminal records are used to paint an inaccurate picture of criminal justice involvement by prosecutors. And it's connected to money bail and how they ask for bail as a result of having had that contact and that conviction. And just to build on what Scott was saying with respect to the DATs and thinking that, well, here we are in a situation where we're, we're having less arrests and we have DATs and how good DATs are, but let's not kid ourselves. The same patterns of racial disparities that existed with the arrest still exists with the DATs. So the policing has not changed. Unless we totally and completely legalize, we will find ourselves in the same situation, creating the same patterns, hearing the same anecdotes. Again, I just want to fi finish up by saying that we support the Start Spark New York campaign as a critical step forward in repairing the harms of the hypercriminalization that marijuana has created. The campaign is ed dedicated to ending marijuana prohibition, rooted in the belief that marijuana prohibition in New York has historically been racially biased, unjust, unequal, and destructive to communities of color. At the core of the campaign and the legislation is the understanding that th it is critical to regulate the marijuana industry with provisions that ensure diversity in licensing and employment to provide new opportunities for social and economic advancement. We support the decriminalization of marijuana and the legalization of marijuana as we believe it will have a positive impact on public health and the criminal justice system by helping stop the funneling of black and Latino and Latinx people into the criminal justice system. The decriminalization of marijuana would enable safer communities and help building better relationships between the community and the police. Instead of criminalizing people for marijuana possession and leaving them with criminal records that land them in deportation proceedings, the money saved must be invested into communities of color who have 
borne the, burn, the brunt of this form of hypercriminalization to create economic justice and begin to restore the harms of this failed policy. Thank you very much for your time.